Hello, and welcome to World of Warbirds. I'm Brian Pierce. Hello, Warbirders. So, in my continuing effort to bring you weird and wonderful Warbirds, I'd like to introduce you to a really strange one that comes out of the Grumman stable. If we look at Grumman's early product line, we go from the FF1, which was also known as the Fifi Fighter, then following the FF1, Grumman's aircraft end up being called by an F, then a number, and then another F. There was the F2F, then the F3F, then the F4F Wildcat, then the F6F Hellcat, the F7F Tirecat, and the F8F Bearcat, and so on. Did you notice the missing number? What happened to the F5F? Let's find out. The mystery plane did exist, and it was born due to a need, a need for speed. In 1935, the U.S. Navy Bureau of Aeronautics first started pondering a twin-engine carrier fighter, and by 1937, these ponderings had bloomed into a full-fledged worry that single-engine airplanes with 1,000-horsepower engines would not be getting much faster than the Grumman F4F Wildcat that they had ordered the year before in 1936. So the Navy put out a requirement for a fighter with a weight of less than 9,000 pounds and an overall speed to be as fast as possible. The engines to be used were the Pratt & Whitney R1530 or R1830 radial engines or the Allison V1710 liquid-cooled engine. Manufacturers came up with several proposals and they all got the X designation because they were all experimental. Number one was the Bell XFL-1 Aero Bonita, which was the naval version of the Aerocobra, powered by one 1,150-horsepower Allison V-1710 engine. But the Navy didn't like the idea of liquid-cooled engines springing leaks out over the ocean, so the Aero Bonita was doomed. Vought proposed their XF4U1, which was powered by one 1,850-horsepower Pratt & Whitney XR2800 engine. Hey, wait a minute. That engine wasn't on the competition list. That's cheating. But somehow it was allowed, and what would become known as the Corsair would continue in the competition. And Grumman came up with the XF5F. They were also allowed to change engines, and so it was powered by two 1,200-horsepower Wright R1820 engines, which were geared to rotate in opposite directions to cancel out each other's torque. Now, I've studied many strange-looking flying machines, and even compared to those, the Skyrocket is a weird-looking bird. The two radial engines are way out in front. The blunt nose fuselage is so far back that there was actually a section of leading edge of the wing in front of the nose. The nose is so far back it looks like somebody made a mistake. The fuselage was stubby with a horizontal stabilizer that has quite a pronounced dihedral and then twin fins. The wings would fold just outboard of the engines but not in the usual Grumman stow wing manner. These folded up with the wingtips almost meeting above it, above the fuselage. The XF5F1 made its maiden flight on April 1st, 1940. Supposedly, it had good flight characteristics and was fast with a maximum speed of 383 miles per hour at 20,000 feet. Where it kicked everybody's butt was rate of climb, where it could shoot up at 4,000 feet per minute. For comparison, the experimental Corsair's climb rate was only 2,600 feet per minute. I guess that's why the XF5F got the name of Skyrocket. Test pilots actually gave it pretty good reviews. Grumman's test pilot, Connie Converse, said, in quotes, The flying characteristics for the XF5F1 were good overall. The counter-rotating props were a nice feature, virtually eliminating the torque effect on takeoff. Single-engine performance was good. Rudder forces tended to be high in single-engine configuration. Spin recovery was positive, but elevator forces required for recovery were unusually high. All aerobatics were easily performed, and of course, forward visibility was excellent. Close quotes. 
but it did have trouble with oil cooling, had excessive drag, and the landing gear doors just would not close properly. But Grumman tinkered and tinkered with the Skyrocket. They modified the oil cooling ducts, reduced the height of the cockpit canopy, and changed the armament installation to 450 calibers. Cleaned up the engine nacelles and added spinners to the props. Grumman made about 70 test flights while fixing things before delivering it to the Naval Air Station at Anacostia on February 22, 1941. Lieutenant Commander Comelin, who was in charge of the Navy's test program, which was looking at multiple aircraft at the time, stated, in quotes, For instance, I remember testing the XF-5F against the XF-4U on climb to 10,000 foot level. I pulled away from the Corsair so fast I thought he was having engine trouble. The F-5F was a carrier pilot's dream as opposite rotating propellers eliminated all torque and you had no large engine up front to look around to see the LSO, the landing signal officer. The analysis of all the data definitely favored the F-5F. So why was the F-5F not chosen? There was a worry about procuring spare parts. Also, two engines are great, but then again you've got to build and maintain two engines for every fighter, which is a drag on supply. Especially if only one will do just fine. Lastly, supposedly the landing gear wasn't up to Grumman's usual ironworks standard, and in fact, it ultimately was a landing gear failure that finally finished off the only prototype ever built. The Skyrocket had made 211 flights and flying time totaled 155.7 hours. So the Skyrocket was cancelled and the Wildcat and Corsair were selected for mass production to fight World War II. And so that was the end of the Skyrocket and it was forgotten forever until this very moment. Not quite. Not quite at all. Because a little like the Energizer Bunny elements of the Skyrocket would keep going and going and going. First was the Army offshoot cousin of the X-5F called the XP-50 Interceptor. It was ordered by the U.S. Army Air Corps on March 11, 1939 and was the first Grumman fighter developed for the Army. In my opinion, it was actually a much more pretty airplane than the naval version with a long, sleek nose that actually resembles an ME-262 nose a little bit. Within that nose would be nestled two 20mm cannon and two 50 caliber machine guns. It was also installed with self-sealing fuel tanks and armor to protect the pilot. Its two engines were turbo-supercharged. Everything was going gangbusters with the Army Skyrocket until disaster struck when one of the turbo superchargers blew up, damaging the landing gear. The right gear was stuck down, and the nose gear was stuck up. With all the other damage, and unable to do either a belly or normal landing, the test pilot bailed out and the Skyrocket went into Long Island Sound. The XP-50 was abandoned. So that's it for the legacy of the Skyrocket, right? Nope. Grumman seems to have a real stubborn streak, and so never really quit on the idea of the twin-engine carrier fighter. Eventually, the spirit and some of the DNA of the Skyrocket would end up in another Grumman cat. The F-7F Tiger Cat. And lastly for the F-5F, for a whole generation of comic book readers, the Skyrocket was not a one-off prototype aircraft failure, but was the trusty steed and superweapon of the Black Hawk team of World War II era ace pilots who operated their Skyrockets from a hidden base known as Black Hawk Island and flew out to oppose tyranny and oppression and evil. The Black Hawk comic book has run on and off for decades in various incarnations. The creator of the comic book, Will Eisner, stated, open quotes, So we came up with the idea of using a certain model Grumman airplane, which had a very strange configuration. It had tail fins coming out from under a wing. It also apparently had the capacity to make rapid takeoffs from the deck of an aircraft carrier. 
It was a Navy plane, as I remember, not an Army Air Force plane. Actually, in real life, it turned out to be not as good a plane as everybody thought it would be, but it sure looked sexy. Close quotes. And is that then the end of this skyrocket story? Maybe. But with the way that Hollywood is recycling superhero stories for movies these days, could we possibly be seeing a Black Hawk movie with skyrockets flying out to fight tyranny? Gee, I hope so. If you enjoy learning about these weird and wonderful warbirds, then show your love by hitting me with a super thanks, a like, or subscribe, or join me on Patreon. Check out the dozens of other videos and the hours of audio content in the extensive back catalog of podcast episodes. Until next time.